We live in interesting times. Fourth headlines. Warnings of catastrophic conditions are in place across the Australian state of New South Wales where firefighters are tackling more than 100 blazes. Hong Kong police have called for an end to violence amid ongoing protests. Lebanese protesters keep up demands for a complete overhaul of the political establishment as the country's Prime Minister designate Hassan Dia begins talks on forming a new government. And police presence in Jakarta has been beefed up by an additional 10,000 personnel ahead of the holidays to guard against potential terror attacks. I'm Alma Angeles, wherever you're watching from around the world. Thank you very much for joining us. We welcome our viewers here in the Philippines and around the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Cepeda. And now to the news. Warnings of catastrophic conditions are now in place across the Australian state of New South Wales, where firefighters are tackling more than 100 blazes. Take a look. on the Bells Line of Road, we just pulled up to this fruit barn here that uh, was unprotected. It uh, started to get into the building. We've managed to stop it at this stage, but uh, yeah, it's going to be crazy here at the moment. There's numerous properties uh, being... A scorching heat wave intensified bushfires ravaging parts of Australia. Australia's eastern coast has been hit by a record-breaking heat wave which has moved in from the west of the country, fanning hundreds of fires in its path. Holiday plans have been hit with national parks closing campsites and the main coastal road linking Sydney with southeastern beach towns again shot due to the impact of fires. Conditions eased markedly on Monday but authorities said in the last few days almost 200 homes have been damaged by fires in South Australia and New South Wales. Now, authorities also said little was left of the small town of Balmoral, southwest of Sydney, where 67-year-old artist Steve Harrison told public broadcaster ABC he had been forced to weather the fire from a makeshift kiln. A historic heat wave in Australia shattered monthly heat records for the state of Victoria at numerous localities and caused destructive bushfires to spread even more inju or injuring some firefighters along the way. Here's Ian Lianetta for the report. Australia's hottest record ever has been broken on the 19th of December with temperature reaching as high as 45 Celsius degrees. According to the Bureau of Meteorology, the rising temperatures intensify the ongoing bushfires. As the bushfires continue, the air quality returned to hazardous levels, leaving suburbs and the CBD covered in a blanket of smoke. In Buxton, New South Wales, fires have engulfed the homes of the residences near Green Wattle Creek. Due to the severity of the fires, three firefighters were seriously injured and three individuals were sent to Liverpool Hospital to be treated for their serious injuries. As of now, there are currently 20 properties that have been affected in Greenwater Creek and the blaze in this area remains in emergency levels. 
The fires at Gospers Mountain still continue to burn and spread, which includes Green Wattle Creek and the Hawkesbury area. In Sydney's west, it is predicted to reach temperatures of 47 in the coming days. The sweltering weather is predicted to also continue in the festive holidays. Help Authorise and the New South Wales Department of Environment urge the public to avoid the outdoors, especially those with respiratory conditions. Additionally, they advise the public to stay hydrated and cool. I am Ian Lanetta and I am one with 25. Under fire, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison rejected calls for reckless and job-destroying cuts to the country's vast coal industry in the face of the deadly climate-fueled bushfire crisis. Morrison's conservative government has fiercely defended the lucrative coal industry in Australia. He said, quote, what we won't do is engage in reckless and job-destroying and economy-crunching targets which are being sought. He told this to Channel 9, responding to calls for more climate-friendly policies. Prime Minister Morrison's media blitz came as he sought to limit the political fallout from a much-criticized Hawaiian holiday taken as bushfires destroyed an area the size of Belgium and unleashed toxic smoke into Australia's major cities. The death toll from New Zealand's devastating White Island eruption has risen to 19, with police confirming Monday another death in hospital. The toll includes two people whose bodies have not been recovered. A police spokesman said they were informed that a person had died late Sunday in an Auckland hospital. 47 people were visiting the privately owned Volcanic Island, a popular tourist destination off the east coast of New Zealand's North Island when the eruption occurred. In other news, five people have been sentenced to death over the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, but two top figures investigated over the killing have been exonerated. The Washington Post columnist was murdered in October 2018 after walking into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to obtain documents in order to marry his fiancée, Hatis Senjis. The 59-year-old Saudi insider turned critic, was strangled, and his body was cut into pieces by a 15-man Saudi squad inside the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul. According to Turkish officials, his remains have not been found. We found that Khashoggi's murder was not premeditated, Saudi Deputy General Prosecutor Shalan al Shalaan told a press conference. Saudi Arabia's public prosecutor announced the sentences on Monday, but specified that a former advisor of the Saudi prince, Saud al Qatani would not be charged. The Khashoggi murder rattled the world at a time when Saudi Arabia and its de facto leader, Prince Mohammed, were pushing an aggressive public relations campaign to rebrand the ultra-conservative kingdom as a modern state. The United Nations and human rights groups have called for an independent investigation into the killing. Hong Kong riot police broke up a sol solidarity rally for China's Uyghurs on Sunday with one officer drawing a pistol as the city's pro-democracy movement likened their plight to that of the oppressed Muslim minority. The initially peaceful rally descended into chaos when a small group of protesters removed a Chinese flag from a nearby government building and tried to burn it. Take a look.
大家好,我是民間集會團隊的劉永康 Meanwhile, Hong Kong police have called for an end to violence amid the ongoing protests. The comment was made by Kwa Kwa Chin the Chief Superintendent of Hong Kong Police from the Public Relations Branch during a press conference held in Hong Kong. Take a look. Very sadly, the redness edge of rioters have pushed our rule of law to the brink of total collapse. Since June, there has been a significant increase in the number of hard crime, including burglary, arson, and armed robberies. Just within this month, there has been several cases involving genuine firearms. What's worse, some lawless people willfully obstruct our frontline officers in carrying out their duties. In Taipo last Friday, an offender fired a shot with a pistol to attack the police. When handling this dangerous case, our officers were actually surrounded and obstructed by radicals. Such ridiculous acts have made our work even more difficult than it already is. As a case in point, in Edinburgh Place in Central yesterday, some radical protesters removed a national flag from a pole, threw it onto the ground, and trashed it. Our officers were duty bound to enter the park to remove the damaged flag. However, as our officers were leaving, an outlumbering mob launched an attack and threw various hard objects at them. They even attempted to help an arrested person escape. Some rioters even pushed our officer onto the ground and slashed his belt. This was a very dangerous and chaotic situation. With Christmas around the corner, everyone wished for a joyful holiday and to spend quality time with their loved ones. However, we are aware of some dangerous online comment inciting others to commit destructive acts like setting fire in, to a Christmas tree in a shopping mall. Not only does this pose a serious threat to public safety, this also wrecked it with joyful season that we all have right to enjoy. In conclusion, social unrest and widespread rioting has, have punched Hong Kong into a chaotic panic situation over the past six months. Almost every MTR station has suffered varying degrees of damage. University MTR station, for instance, was just reopened after being closed for almost a, a month. Our main transport route and harbour crossings have been blocked, and over 700 sets of traffic lights have been damaged. Please stop challenging the rule of law. It's high time we put an end to violence for good. We, police officer, will spend every effort to give you all a truly peaceful. And Merry Christmas. Thank you. Prime Minister Narendra Modi sought Sunday to reassure India's Muslims as a wave of deadly protest against a new citizenship law put his Hindu nationalist government under pressure like never before. Congress or Arpan Naksaliodwara. उड़ाई गई डिटेंशन सेंटर के पाए सरासर झूठ है 
बट इरादे वाली है देश को तबाह करने के नापाक इरादों से भरी पड़ी है ये झूठ है झूठ है झूठ है Prime Minister Modi also said there had been no discussion about a nationwide register of citizens, which many Muslims in India fear is targeted mainly at them. At least 25 people have, been, have died in almost two weeks of demonstrations and violence after Modi's government passed the law criticized as anti-Muslim. More protests took place on Sunday. The U.S. State Department. This week, urged New Delhi to protect the rights of its religious minorities in keeping with India's constitution and democratic values. Prime Minister Modi's government, re-elected in May, has defended the law, saying it is meant to help persecuted minorities from Muslim-majority Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. Lebanese protesters chanted anti-government slogans and waved flags near the parliament in downtown Beirut. They were keeping up demands for a complete overhaul of the political establishment as the country's prime minister-designate, Hassan Dia, begins talks on forming a new government. Debt burden Lebanon has been without a fully functioning government since former Prime Minister Saad Hariri resigned on October 29 in the face of nationwide protests. Demonstrators are demanding an overhaul of the political establishment which they had deemed corrupt and inept, insisting on a government of independents and experts with no ties to the country's sectarian parties. Hassan Diab, an engineering professor designate Thursday to form a desperately needed government had asked protesters to give him a chance to form a cabinet of independent experts within four to six weeks. But the self-styled technocrats call for consultations with representatives of the popular movement on Sunday failed to draw prominent street leaders or groups. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. MTRCV ang mag-provide na appropriate rating. us all the time in our community in our country around the world events that affect people move communities or simply inspire us interesting events that people need to know in these interesting times we continue to be a competent partner in delivering news about these events fast accurate balance eagle news because we live in interesting times. Regime forces have seized dozens of towns and villages in northwest Syria from jihadists following days of violent clashes, fueling an exodus of civilians, a war monitor said Sunday. The Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said the British advances in Idlib came as Russian warplanes continued to pummel the province's south, killing nine civilians who were trying to escape the flashpoint area on Sunday. Russia and China on Friday vetoed a UN Security Council resolution that would have extended for a year 
cross-border aid deliveries to 4 million Syrians, many of them in Idlib. Наш документ именно продлевает механизм трансгранички. Ранее мы воздерживались от его поддержки, но и не блокировали, осознавая гуманитарные потребности населения Сирии. В этом году мы готовы его поддержать. Он предполагает доступ к помощи на северо-запад Сирии, где по-прежнему такое содействие необходимо. Свой шаг на встречу нашим коллегам мы сделали. В ответ же мы получили второе, затем и третье проекты гуманитарной тройки, которые по-прежнему содержат положение в отрыве от объективной реальности. Считаем такой подход нечестным. The consequences of the Russian Federation and China's vetoes of this Security Council resolution will be disastrous. This decision is reckless, irresponsible and cruel. Right now in Syria, four million people depend on the UN's cross-border assistance mechanism for medicine, shelter, and food. There is no justification imaginable for any member of this Security Council leaving vulnerable Syrian civilians with fewer means of securing vital aid. There are more than 4 million people in need of cross-border assistance in Syria. Today, the Security Council has failed them. This is a sad day for the Syrian people. Syria's war has killed over 370,000 people and displaced millions since beginning in 2011 with the brutal repression of anti-government protests. A series of explosions rocked Sunday night, a southern Philippine city known for Islamic State-linked violence, wounding at least 17 people, including soldiers, according to a military official. A hand grenade was thrown into a military truck patrolling Cotabato City in the restive southern island of Mindanao with eight soldiers and four civilians sustaining injuries from the bomb's shrapnel. It was quickly followed by an improvised explosive device or IED blast in the nearby town of Libungan, wounding five civilians with one in serious condition according to regional military spokesperson Major Arvin Encinas. Another explosion was recorded in the neighboring town in Maguindanao although police are still gathering information on whether there are casualties. Regional military spokesperson Major Arvin Ancina said, and I quote, We do not discount the possibility that Bang Samoro Islamic Freedom Fighters or BIFF and Daesh-inspired groups are behind this. Those groups, including the Islamic State-aligned BIFF and Abu Sayyaf, a kidnap for ransom gang, has been behind some of the nation's deadliest attacks. Philippine troops rescued two abducted Indonesian sailors in Sunday pre-dawn raid on an Islamist militant stronghold which left two dead, a military official said. A soldier and a militant of kidnapped for ransom group Abu Sayyaf, which was behind some of the nation's worst attacks, were killed during a 30-minute gunfight in the mountainous town of Panamao on the southern island of Holo. The pair were among three Indonesian sailors abducted by the militants in September off Malaysian waters near the southern tip of the Philippine island of Mindanao. Military Commander Lieutenant General, or Ge Lieutenant General Oserilito Sobihana said a military operation was underway to rescue the other Indonesian captive. The rescue, or the rescue came a month after a British man and his wife were freed by soldiers and said they were threatened with beheading by militants if they did not deliver a ransom. In many, or in May, Dutch birdwatcher Ewald Horn was killed by his captors as he tried to escape during a rescue operation after being held captive for seven years. And staying in the Philippines, authorities said eight people died and hundreds were taken to hospitals in the Philippines 
after drinking coconut wine or lambanog believed to contain high levels of methanol. The victims all attended gatherings over the weekend in the town of Rizal, southeast of Manila, and complained of stomach pains after drinking the wine known locally as lambanog. Jose Jonas Del Rosario, spokesman for the capital's Philippine General Hospital, said nine victims are in a critical condition. Police said in total, 300 victims were taken to hospitals, all drank the same brand of wine that had been bought in the area. The local government has imposed an immediate ban on the sale of the beverage, which is in high demand over the holidays. Much of the coconut wine or lambanog on the market is manufactured by locals in backyard operations. And Dr. Del Rosario said one of the byproducts of coconut wine fermentation is methanol, which can cause blindness and death. Some manufacturers keep the methanol in because it means greater volume and more profit. Police presence in Jakarta has been beefed up by an additional 10,000 personnel ahead of the holidays to guard against potential terror attacks as part of Operation Candle 2019. Jelas saat ini yang kita gunakan adalah mengantisipasi, jadi tetap kita melakukan pengamanan, kita lebih waspada dan kita maksimalkan pengamanan yang ada di sana. Indonesian authorities have deployed an unprecedented 192,000 police and military personnel nationwide to secure holiday celebrations across the country. Footage shot on Monday shows security personnel marching and taking to the streets of the capital. Indonesia is a Muslim-majority country with 24 million non-Muslims constituting 10% of the population. The Berlin police commented on the evacuation of a Christmas market after two people were taken into custody for acting suspiciously on Saturday. Here's Berlin police spokesperson Thilo Keblitz. Gegen 19 Uhr, kurz vor 19 Uhr, haben Einsatzkräfte von uns zwei Personen festgestellt, die sich hier verdächtig verhalten haben hier am Breitscheidplatz und doch sehr schnell vom Breitscheidplatz entfernt haben. Daraufhin haben sich die Einsatzkräfte dazu entschlossen, diese beiden Personen zu überprüfen, weil wir gerade bei dem Thema Breitscheidplatz und zu dieser Jahreszeit natürlich hochsensibel sind. Bei der Überprüfung wurde festgestellt, dass auf den Namen einer dieser Personen eine Fahndung besteht. Daraufhin wurden die Personen in Gewahrsam genommen, um die Identitäten einwandfrei zu klären. <lacht> Parallel dazu haben wir hier Maßnahmen hochgefahren. Wir konnten nicht ausschließen, dass sich auf dem Weihnachtsmarkt womöglich verdächtige Gegenstände befinden. Deshalb haben wir den Weihnachtsmarkt geräumt, weiträumig abgesperrt und mit Sprengstoffspürhunden abgesucht. Police also stressed that after cordoning, cordoning off and searching the area, nothing suspicious was found. Three years ago, 12 people were killed and more than 50 injured in a terror attack at this same market. The death toll from storms that have battered Spain, Portugal and France rose to nine on Sunday as the region braced for more violent winds and heavy rain. Storms Elsa and Fabienne have flooded rivers, brought down power lines, uprooted trees and disrupted rail and air travel across the region, leaving more than 118,000 households without electricity. Two people have so far died in Portugal and seven have now been killed in Spain, the worst affected country, after a fisherman was swept off rocks into the sea in Catalonia. In a battered its Atlantic coast. An accident involving 69 vehicles left 51 people injured on the I-64 highway in York County. 
near Williamsburg in Virginia, according to Virginia State Police. Take a look. The congestion was so tight that some vehicles had been pushed off the road by other cars that were forced underneath their frames. First responders were also forced to walk across the wreckage on the roofs of these vehicles. The cause is still under investigation, but at the time of the crash, police said ice was present on the Queens Creek Bridge and heavy fog covered the area. While there were no immediate reports of fatalities, police said 51 victims were transported and or treated at four local hospitals. Officials also said details on the extent of the injuries couldn't be disclosed at the time. York County Fire Chief Steve Kopsinchinsky told reporters that of those being treated, two remained in critical condition and 11 suffered serious non-life-threatening injuries. The remaining victims suffered minor injuries. Ecuador activated emergency protocol Sunday to contain the environmental impact of a fuel spill in the Galapagos Islands after a barge carrying 600 gallons of diesel fuel sank. Take a look. The accident occurred in a port on San Cristobal Island, the easternmost island in the chain, when a crane collapsed while loading a container onto the barge. The falling container destabilized the ship, causing it to sink. Military personnel and environmentalists were putting up containment barriers and absorbent cloths to reduce the environmental risk of the sinking of the Orca barge with 600 gallons of diesel fuel stored on it, tweeted the Galapagos National Park, the official nature reserve authority. Units from the Ecuadorian Navy and National Police were co coordinating with the GNP to resolve the emergency and assess environmental damage. Environment Minister Raul Ledesma tweeted that the government had taken immediate actions to reduce the environmental risk. He also ordered the necessary contingency measures to be taken to overcome this unfortunate event. In other news, a U.S. budget official told the Pentagon to hold off on military aid to Kiev 90 minutes after a controversial phone call between President Trump and his Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky, according to an internal email. The email was part of a series published by the investigative nonprofit Center for Public Integrity. President Trump is accused of withholding $400 million in assistance to Ukraine to push Kiev to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden. Based on guidance one, based on guidance, rather, I have received and in light of the administration's plan to review assistance to Ukraine, please hold off on any additional DOD obligations of these funds, Office of Management and Budget Official Michael Duffy wrote in an email to Pentagon officials. The email is time-stamped time 11.04 a.m., an hour and 31 minutes after President Trump's controversial July 25 phone call with Zelensky ended, according to a summary of the conversation released by the White House. Republicans defended the move in a December 2 House of Representatives staff report, saying it was not unusual for foreign aid to be delayed, the Center for Public Integrity noted. Now, top Senate Democrat Chuck Schumer, meanwhile, called the emails explosive in a tweet Sunday denouncing President Trump's refusal to let certain White House officials testify. He wrote this email from Michael Duffy approximately 90 minutes after President Trump's call with the President of Ukraine is all the more reason why we need Duffy and others to testify in a Senate trial. The sensitive nature, what is that about? The Professional Footballers Association called for a government inquiry into racism in football after Chelsea's 2-0 Premier League win at Tottenham on Sunday was marred by alleged racist comments from the crowd, the latest in a string of recent incidents. 
Chelsea manager Frank Lampard said the problem needed to be dealt with strongly and Tottenham promised a thorough investigation after referee Anthony Taylor halted play during the second half when Antonio Rodiger complained of hearing monkey noises from spectators. I, I don't know. I don't know if he's getting better or worse or not. We're much more aware of the fact that we have a protocol and to report it is obviously a positive step. Of course, we're in the perfect world. We wish that's not needed. Um, I don't know whether it's getting better or worse, but if it is fact and it's true and it happened, then it needs to be dealt with and punishment needs to be strong. Moments earlier, the Chelsea defender had been involved in a second-half clash with Sun Hyung Min with, that saw the South Koreans set off. Shortly after the stoppage, an announcement made over the public address system warned that racist behavior among spectators is interfering with the game and Taylor spoke to both managers Lampard and Jose Mourinho. Two further, or two further public address announcements followed after play was resumed. The incident comes a year after racism in football hit the headlines after Manchester City striker Raheem Sterling was subjected to racist abuse at Stamford Bridge in December 2018, which led to a permanent ban for a Chelsea supporter. Sterling was also one of a number of England players who faced monkey chants and Nazi salutes in Euro 2020 qualifiers this year. In other news, Croatia's fight or Croatia's tight presidential race will go to a runoff vote in two weeks after exit polls and initial returns indicated that none of the candidates had won the office outright. Croatia's conservative president narrowly made it to a runoff election against the leftist former premier on Sunday after a nationalist folk singer won over a large chunk of her camp's far right wing. Take a look. Uh, imala sam i jakog sukandidata sukandidata na svom političkom spektru za razliku od gospodina Milanovića ali eto sada se moramo svi skupiti na okup i idemo u pobjedu Niko se u Hrvatskoj koji će biti predsjednik neće osjećati kao građanin ili građanka drugog preda Milanovic and Grabar Kitarovic now will face each other in a second round of voting January 5. The hotly contested first round vote signaled the appeal of populism in a Balkan country struggling with an influx of migrants at its borders, an emigration exodus and widespread corruption. With nearly all ballots counted, center-left former Prime Minister Zoran Milanovic took the lead with 29.5% of the vote, according to the Electoral Commission. Incumbent President Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic garnered 26.6%, eking out a second-place finish just two points ahead of 57-year-old far-right singer Miroslav Skoro. Though the post is largely ceremonial in Croatia, the president formally commands the army and represents the country abroad. Keeping the presidency is important for the ruling Croatian Democratic Union Party as its government is set to assume the EU rotating chairmanship on January 1 that will include overseeing Brexit and the start of post-Brexit talks. While Croatia is also known globally for its stunning coastline and island getaways, the Adriatic country is no paradise for locals who are fed up with sluggish economy and rampant corruption. Boeing's CSC-100 Starliner spacecraft made a safe landing in New Mexico on Sunday after technical issues forced it to make an early return from a mission to dock to the International Space Station, or ISS. Take a look. The spacecraft landed at White Sands Space Harbor at 5.58 local time. The Starliner capsule was launched Friday from Cape Canaveral in Florida, but shortly after separating from its Atlas V launch rocket, its thrusters failed to activate as planned, 
preventing it from reaching a high enough orbit. A space station orbits at an altitude of about 400 kilometers above sea level. The mission was expected to be the final major flight before the spacecraft was available for flying NASA astronauts. You know, on Friday, uh, after the separation of the vehicle from, from the launch vehicle, um, you know, we had some challenges. And I, I was very clear that a lot of things went right. And a lot of things did, in fact, go right. Um, but we had a lot more left to do. We had to test the vehicle itself. We had to test entry, descent, and landing. Um, and so I can tell you this morning, we're all very excited that a whole lot more things did go right. We, <laughs> you look at the landing, it was an absolute bullseye better than I think anybody anticipated. Um, and so that's good for the agency, it's good for Boeing, um, and it's good for the United States of America. Um, of course, we had the challenge with the mission elapsed time, which ultimately resulted in you know, the spacecraft believing it, it was in a place where it wasn't and trying to make corrections to get where it, was, where it thought it should be. Um, but we got control of the spacecraft. We flew the spacecraft very successfully. Um, we did not make it to the International Space Station. We did not dock. Um, but the spacecraft flew exceptionally well, and then, of course, we brought the spacecraft home. Eagle News International will be right back. Stay tuned. Gorgeous white sandy beaches that stay cool to touch even on the hottest summer days. Blue green ocean waves and the warm ocean breeze. There's no wonder why Dr. Beach is named Siesta Key, Florida, the number one beach in the United States. Don't forget to watch episodes of Digital Nest every Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30 p.m. I'm Melissa Protest coming to you from Siesta Key, Florida, and I am one with 25. Beijing will lower import tariffs on more than 850 products ranging from frozen pork to high-tech parts next year, lowering trade barriers to support the economy. China's pig industry has been hammered by African swine fever, which has led to the culling of more than a million animals, according to official statistics, and caused the price of pork to double. Monday's announcement said tariffs on frozen pork will drop from 12% to 8%, from January 1. The move does not appear to be linked to the bruising trade war between China and the U.S., which has seen Washington and Beijing exchanging levies on goods worth hundreds of billions of dollars, dragging on global growth. However, President Trump retweeted two press reports on the tariff reduction on Monday without any additional comment. And the list includes many items that Chinese companies purchase from the U.S., such as pork and tech goods. An analyst also said the move was an indication of China's desire to show it is opening up after this month's mini-deal with the U.S. to reduce some levies and work towards a wider pact. Other imports that will see a drop in tariff rates include frozen, avocado, and some wood and paper products. China will also eliminate tariffs on certain asthma and diabetes medications, as well as on some semiconductors. The lower tariffs will benefit many of its trading partners, including New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, and Pakistan. After a complicated weekend for travelers, France is experiencing its 19th day of a transport strike against pension reform. Only 40% of TGV and TUR trains are in circulation. President Emmanuel Macron issued an appeal on Saturday for a truce over the holidays, three days after talks between the government and unions failed to ease the standoff and labor leaders called for the further mobilization. Workers at the SNCF and RATP Rail the public transport companies have downed tools to protest at the government's plan to meld France's 42 pension schemes into a single points-based one, which would see some public employees lose certain privileges. 
Weeks of travel misery worsened on Sunday when tens of thousands planned to meet up with family and friends for the holiday break. Meanwhile, floods continue in Venice as Aqua Alta, or high water, reportedly reached 120 centimeters or 47 inches. Footage from Sunday shows the flood-stricken San Marcos Square and some tourists who braved the weather to take pictures. Take a look. However, hoteliers made clear that all activities function properly in the city and that Venice is safe again for everyone, including children and the elderly. They stress that Aqua Alta is nothing traumatic, but that many hotel guests even consider it a fun experience. The Venice Hotel Association is calling on tourists all over the world to come to see for themselves the beauty of a city that has always lived with high tides, which hoteliers stressed come and go. They fear that the many cancellations received by hotels following the extraordinary high tide of November 12 has scared tourists away. Our tour this morning got cancelled. Um, we weren't expecting that. Um, and I didn't bring boots, obviously, so I bought these things for the day. I think it's, um, it's like the best time to see Venice, really. Like we could have come in the summer. Well, we've had friends come in the summer before. Um, it's nice to see it like this. This is different. This is uh, it's more real. I think. So, um, yeah, we, we had a look and see what the high water's like. Uh, yeah, this is something we wanted to see, so, and, and experience as well. It's actually kind of, it's something that you only see once in a lifetime, so it's kind of interesting. According to reports, hotel bookings dropped by almost half following November's flood, which was the highest tide in over 50 years. On November 12, the Aqua Alta reached 73 inches, the highest level since the record of 194 centimeters set in 1966. New Zealand Police conducts art competition for detention cell units. Young Filipino student is one of the finalists. Watch this. Police station has conducted an art competition, replicas of the winning entrance of which are now being displayed on the whole walls of its detention cell units. This art display is intended to creating a positive experience, particularly those who have been held accountable for their offenses. The art competition resulted to more than 50 submissions from all over New Zealand by people from all walks of life, including the prisoners themselves. 14 art entries were chosen as finalists, three of which won the top monetary prizes. In a ceremony held at the Wellington Central Police Station, senior sergeants to tell forth supervisor of the detention cell unit and the one who spearheaded the competition said that the focus of such contest was for people who wanted to make a difference by contributing to making the holding units a more positive place through their artworks. Among others, he also thanked those who participated in as he expressed his satisfaction of the beautiful and colorful entries received, which reflected meaningfully the theme of the competition dubbed AFI, which means help and support in the Maori language. On the other hand, Inspector Ginny Wealth, the acting Wellington Central Police Station District Commander, expressed her confidence on the positive contributions of the art display to both the offenders and the staff at the police station. Is way if you want to make difference. Uh, Canada and Seoul is a pretty impressive sort of area and people don't want to be here. Uh, we want to be out and engage with them and having the, the art on the wall and uh, being able to speak with the people in our care. It gives us a chance to get to know them a little bit and hopefully we'll have that we're going to be able to refer them to places that can help them with their issues. Now. In, in the end they're in crisis, that's why they're here and we want to see them come. And it's 
just wonderful to be able to exhibit these uh, throughout ourselves for the people who come and stay in, uh, in our field. Uh, a lot of them are here with our folk and with little resilience and it's great that uh, if we can provide them some semblance of hope and something to Milani Corby, a teacher of 24 years and a self-made artist, won the top prize for her entry, conveying the message of relationship of older generation, helping the younger ones in times of need. I'm so proud to be winning this um, for the New Zealand Police. Um, my artwork um, represents two whales embracing each other and supporting each other um, and to help all the communities out there. Among the 14 finalists was Miranda Larum, a year 7 Filipino student from Island Bay, Wellington City, whose artwork was concentrated on the message of giving second chance to those who had committed mistakes in the past. My art is about free chances because when you're in an enclosed space with um, no light, nothing, you don't get much chances. I had lots of animals and creatures um, and lots of brightness as everything is a life to me. Also, animals are more understanding of like humans, but not like specifically talking about like if you think about it. Before the ceremony ended, those who were in attendance were accorded with an opportunity of a guided visit to the holding units for both male and female offenders. Big replicas of artworks were displayed on the hall walls leading from one holding unit to another. The finalists themselves took advantage of such occasion by taking photo mementos with their artworks. The art competition for detention cell units of the Wellington Central Police Station was the first to be conducted among the police stations across New Zealand. Gauging its success, this might not be the last, but the start of more related art competitions in the future. From Wellington City, New Zealand, this is Greg Bessa. I am and will always be one. The Florida Tropics entered the game against the Baltimore Blast as one of two undefeated teams in the MASL. Shane Quaz reports. Riding on a four-game winning streak to open up the Major Arena League soccer season, the Florida Tropics look to stay hot. In just their second home game of the season, the Tropics hosted the 10-time MASL champion, the Baltimore Blast. Though no strangers to winning, the Blast looked nothing like the championship caliber team they were in the past. The offense struggled putting pressure on the Tropics in the first half, only notching in one goal which came in the second quarter to tie the game 1-1. Lucio Gonzaga, who recently joined the Tropics, scored a goal to send the Tropics with a 2-1 lead into halftime. In the second half, the Tropics went full throttle and scored five unanswered goals, courtesy of Lucius Texiera, Ricardo Carvalho, and Gordy Gerson. The Tropics showed great poise with stout defense and high-pressured offense, ultimately sealing the game with two late goals in the fourth quarter by Gonzaga and Gerson, each with two goals for the game. After the game, Victor Pereiras, who scored the first goal of the game, credited the team's off-season moves and chemistry in lieu of their success. I think the off-season signings were on point. We got some on fire on, on top going forward. We have guys going forward and scoring goals, that's amazing, passing, and we're clicking. That's the most important thing, we're finding each other. Despite their winning record, Pereira still believes that they could get better. I think we, we still have a lot of room to improve, going a good path, and we're still, we're still going, we're still going, we still have more to show. The 7-2 route of the blast was the Tropics' most dominant performance of the season. Looking to remain undefeated next week, the Tropics face the Milwaukee Wave, whom they defeated in an overtime thriller earlier this season. For Eagle News and EBC Sports International, this is Shane Quas, always one with 25. Rice Tribe hosted the second annual Filipino Heritage Night 
as the Toronto Raptors beat the struggling Cleveland Cavaliers 133-113 Monday night. Our ABC Canada Bureau's Zarita Cesar reports. Last Monday, the Toronto Raptors took on the Cleveland Cavaliers, a team they once had trouble overcoming in the playoffs. With the Raptors trying to bounce back from a bumpy six-game stretch, a win over the struggling Cleveland squad is the kind of confidence that this team needed. Not only were the Raptors hosting the Cavs at home, but Monday night's game marks the second annual Filipino Heritage Night in collaboration with the nonprofit organization, the Rise Tribe. With the Filipino population continuing to rise in Canada, and especially in Toronto, the importance of an organization like the Rise Tribe is evident, a nonprofit organization founded by a group of young Filipino Canadians. They saw that even younger generations needed guidance when it came to their education and careers. Abby Albino is one of the co-founders who recognized the power that a sport like basketball has when reaching out to younger generations. Playing in sport or being a part of a sports team, you are essentially part of a larger family. So the transition from being a kid who just like was in a Filipino family to someone who's playing in sport actively, it was, it was seamless. So yeah, for me, development in sport is really important. Again, it teaches you leadership, it teaches you all sorts of life skills. Anyone who purchased Filipino Heritage Night tickets were also able to get their hands on an exclusive t-shirt, which is adorned with the Raptor. In addition to t-shirts, those who were able to purchase premium tickets were also treated with some surprises, like a visit from Bobby Webster, the general manager of the Toronto Raptors. Though Filipino communities in Toronto and in Canada as a whole have been present for years, there's a surge of younger Filipino Canadians who, with the help of organizations like the Rise Tribe, are seeing the possibility that are available to them. A lot of them just want to do what they love and that's kind of our generation now. We kind of took it up on our, ourselves to really take somebody who wants to get into photography or wants to get into media and pair them up or at least show them examples of successful Filipino Canadians in those spaces so that they can see that there is representation and that it is possible to achieve that. By the end of the night, the fans were able to see their Toronto Raptors walk away with the win, defeating the Cavs by a score of 133-113. Philippines' own Jordan Clarkson of the Cavaliers finished the night with 9 points in 23 minutes. From the Scotiabank Arena, I'm Zarita Sese, Eagle News, 1 with 25. Thank you, Zarita. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Tumblr. Also, check out our boards and Pinterest and pictures on Instagram. I'm Sam Zabeta. Thanks for joining us. And that's the news for tonight. Join us online and here again tomorrow evening. I'm Alma Angeles and we're, we're one, one with 25. 25.